with, uh, for me, I think you can read stuff about me. I mean, um, a long time involvement in youth and high school. Um, and in the, so I've been around forever. So anyway, we'll, we'll move on here. Um, sort of agenda, we're going to look at vision and mission. Um, what is team culture, building it, good and bad. Culture risks, you can see the um, tools for building it. Um, and, then, and then as we move on, we're going to get into a related topic of player empowerment, which could be a whole presentation in itself, but they're sort of tied together because if you create that culture, then the players are going to be more empowered in the way that they operate and the way they take ownership. So anyway, we'll move on here. First of all, I'm sharing <clears throat> as the director of Eagle Impact, which is a nonprofit, but um, you know, it's the Rugby Academy. Um, we, we operate with a nationwide focus, but if you don't have a vision and mission, then what leads your club, right? And, and this really comes from <clears throat> your leadership, and you, you're here, you're, you're probably in leadership roles in your club, right? So. Is there, is there a clear vision? Is, is there a clear mission? If we were asked your players, hey, what's your mission? Oh, we're going to win the state championship, right? Okay, it could be a mission, right? But what's your vision? And what's your, is your vision and your mission aligned to the players? Right? Um, so are, is it something that you clearly want to direct the ship, right? It's a compass. Where are we going? Um, when you look at team culture, <clears throat> really it's driven by values, isn't it? You know, what you believe in, uh, what the players believe in, uh, the characteristics at the end of the day, win or, or lose, um, what do you want to portray? You know, how, how do you want others to think about you? How do you want your teammates to think about you at the end of your career, right, when you look back? Who are those teammates you you know you really respected uh, and valued? <clears throat> so there's obviously do you survey your um, your team? Do you say, hey guys, what's important to us? Right? Some teams and you know I'm I'm, I'm in all levels of the game. Like at Tempe, has been my club f for 30 years, and um, they have their youth ranks and. Our senior club, and God knows, I've been through the highs and lows with with uh, you know Division Two rugby, you know, and uh, and um, but I love it, and uh, I wouldn't I would move to another club, right? Um, but I've seen it on the brink of disaster, and I've seen it rebuild, and you know, and we have to visit <coughs> the whole value thing about what we are and what we represent almost every season, right? Because when you, just when you expect something to be there, it won't be there. You know? So, <clears throat> attitude, obviously everything drives that. And our goal is it, you know, we're back to our vision and our mission. What do we want? Or, you know, what's the long-term goal? What, what, is it just wins and losses? You know? Uh, do we want to develop young people that are really going to do well in the world, take on the world, you know, be successful? And, and you know, is rugby just a vehicle to really grow young people? And therefore, there's a lot more than just the technical stuff, right? They come to the game, but you're building young people, right? So, do you have to care? Most definitely, right? Because if you don't care, it will show. You're here because you care, I think. You already made a commitment. Uh, I would like to spend a lot of time in this, but again, I don't know if, if we really don't have it. But, you know, what does good team culture look like? What does bad team culture look like? What do you see in your opponent? You know, how does your team behave after a win, after a loss? You know, how, how do they behave with referees? You know, how do they behave to whoever person in the street? You take them on a, 
on a trip, um, or the, you know, did somebody come up to you and say, hey, I want to talk to you, are those kids belong to you? You know, which is always my first reaction is, oh God, you know, what, what have they done, right? And then I remember sitting in Cleveland, actually, at the National Youth Sevens, and elderly couple came up to me in the hotel in the morning and thinking the last thing they want to be is surrounded by 14 year olds. And they said, those are your boys? And I'm like, yes. I said, well, I must say, they're really respectful and overjoyed because they were behaving well when we weren't around, right? And I was thrilled. And I think that, for me, made, made everything. Um, we also ended up losing in the final, and I said to the kids afterwards, it had never really worked with eighth graders before, let alone, in, and then like, oh my God. Because I was a teacher, but I was a high school teacher, and, I, and we lost that final, and, and they, were de they were devastated. And I said, but they played really well. I said, so what, what, what do you think made the difference in the final? The coach would get selfish. I'm so, so honest, and, but I love that group, and I, I love them. Largely because of the culture that they brought and the culture they made. So, um, <clears throat> risk the culture. You know, you get assertive characters that may not be leading them in the right direction. Um, it could become very toxic in a hurry. You know, and then you get people that are marginalized. And if you go, if your club is not growing, and your numbers aren't there, is there a reason? Right? Is the club perceived as a welcoming environment? How do you treat newcomers when they arrive? Right? Because you want to keep them, right? Um, how do you how do you make it a team effort? Get everybody involved. Get them to own it. Because at the end of the day, we, we, we may want something for the club, but the kids may take it in another direction, right? And that may not be aligned. And if you want to have fun in the environment um, and you're not aligned with the club, then that's not going to work for you or them, right? Um, <clears throat> tools, I'd rather not spend a lot of time in this. I think I want you to get a copy of it, but um, provide opportunities to build it, get your leaders involved. Uh, get the players and the staff to define it, define the whole culture thing, um, and and really just get the players and everyone to take ownership. As I said, you'll get a copy of this and you can get it going. I put legacy up here because the old likes obviously the book legacy. Hands up if you've read it. We got a few, right? It's it's one of those things that you need to get a copy and you need to pass it around and get people to read it. Maybe people that really need to read it, read it, right? Um, so, but why, why, does anybody know why the old wax did just make a big swing? Do you know where they were and as opposed to where, to what they've become? Does anybody know the story of them with the embarrassing World Cup losses and getting drunk and getting arrested and all sorts of misdemeanors and they say what's well, run of the mill right rugby but I think with the old blacks it, it became a very negative environment now when they lose like a lot of nations you're under a lot of pressure if you're a black fur and you come back from losing to England twice by big score lines there was articles appearing in the press and about uh, mental stress and and you know, the frustration and the anxiety because you're supposed to win in New Zealand, right? Right? So, um, what's going to be the reaction of Green Bay if they lost? Would it be, you know, God knows I didn't say that, did I? No. <laughs> Not that I think they would lose, but they would lose. Um, on values, um, I want to show. I survey players periodically, right? Pick your top three. You know, if, if, is there any you want to add that isn't on the list, right? So I've sent this to various new groups that are coming together just to get them to process it because 
at the end of the day, if they adopt any of these, it's probably a good thing. Like if care becomes their most important thing, then it's not a bad thing if they care for each other, right? So, but the hierarchy also did it with the staff, because I'm dealing with about 50, 60 coaches at times. They're probably more worse to handle than the kids. And we said, pick your first choice, your second, your third, your fourth, your fifth. So the red would be their number one value. And if you look across the red, integrity came out really high. Um, but if you look at their fifth choice, you know, responsibility, and then that, that was just staff. When I went to uh, players in the 96 responded to this survey, you can see just over there, they're all pretty high, but teamwork came out on top, right? Which, nice to see, right? Um, humbleness was, was a little bit lower, and <laughs> Brad, you had something to say about that? Well, I think in uh, the traditional like, U.S. sports, if you think about it, like if you watch a football game, someone makes a tackle, what's the first thing they do? They go, like, oh, man, you know, it could be a 20-yard game, they make a tackle, they're still out there celebrating, losing by 30. And it's just like, that's kind of the opposite of what rugby's supposed to be. I mean, the only time you celebrate usually is when you score, but even then, it's kind of get up and get get to the next job. But I was I was kind of laughing at that because I was, I was saying, you know, in the American game, I think that's where we could struggle the most in terms of kind of like fitting the rest of the world's mindset when it comes to rugby. Because if you if you look at all the world uh, top international rugby teams, it's it's never individual celebrations. It's never about yourself. It's always about like finding a teammate to jump in and celebrate with, and then you guys are kind of running back together and stuff like that. So I just thought it was a little funny, but also. You can't really have good teamwork without being humble. So that's why I kind of gave the kids the benefit of the doubt because, you know, in order to work as a team, you guys have to be kind of on a level playing. Everybody has to kind of be, respect each other. And yeah, you might be the best, but the end goal is still to provide for the team. So yeah, I just thought it was an interesting stat. And, um, what you kind of need to try to push with your team because if you got a bunch of guys who thinks that they're the uh, they run the show, you know when it gets down to it and it's the last minute and they might put too much weight on their back and try to do it all themselves and that's not really how the game works. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I, I love to watch how players react when they score. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, you go back a bit. I think people criticized Johnny Sexton when he made a like Ireland went through forty phases before he dropped the goal to beat France. And they were jumping up and down and celebrating, but it, it was pretty tremendous moment. So I think you know, not saying that you have to be stern about it, but you know, I think you need to keep it in context. Um, Obviously, culture is all character driven, but the, the number one that keeps coming out all the time is respect. So if you take respect, if you only took one, the, the kids decided that's going to be our, our top value. Well, what, how does that translate in the game, right? The opponent, the teammates, the officials, the spectators, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so. Alex, I won't name a club or a player, but there was a, a scene at Nationals this past year, National High Schools. The game was called a little bit early, and then they played on, and the, and the reaction of, of a player from the team that won was really uh, negative, really. I mean, so to the point where I wouldn't really want to pick anybody in that team. And that was just one person creating that image. You know how it is? One person can say a lot for the program, right? And it's going to fall on us as coaches that we really protect that, right? And draw the limits. <clears throat> Onto the player department piece. This is Allison Bradfield's picture from years ago. Right, Allison, thank you. 
which is quite a unique group, Ruben Nahas, um, you know, this group, um, Saracens, um, you know, at Bradfield in the background there, um, Ben Rozelle, you know, Eagle, and over on the right there, we got Patrick Madden, and on the left, we got Quinn. Perry Hughes, a football player at University of Colorado. So, uh, I love to get moments and pictures like this. John Bannerhall, who is a, a coach that worked with his Army recruiter at West Point, and he came up with this statement. He says, I love to watch you play. And I thought, what a way to, you know, like show something towards your players that you really do love to watch them play. Hopefully play well, right? But it's a really powerful statement because right away it, it sets the scene. Um, high athletes think, learn, and process information. There's a time and place to be direct in your coaching, and there's a time and place to get hands off with them. You know, um, and and. Again, the whole topic of I mean, separate conversation is going from and the elasticity of going from being hands-on direct, like you're teaching a kid how to tackle, to letting them figure out how to play a game better through their analysis, not ours, telling them what to do, right? Can you sort of see yourself in that scenario, in that fluid movement? But this non-negotiables, what are we going to say that's acceptable? Well, let's say the top. Exceptional, acceptable, and unacceptable. Now, it could be behavior, it could be uh, practice, could be a skill, could be a performance side to it, or a behavioral side to it, right? And the, I remember a practice where I saw John use this, where the players were a little bit sloppy, they were dropping some balls that they normally wouldn't drop, and they obviously hadn't started practice with the agreement that they were ready to practice, right? We've all been through that, right? And if, you know, and then there's all those wasted minutes that you never get back because they weren't switched on, right? So John would say, is this acceptable by our standards? They said, well, no, no. So, Okay, so are we going to change it? Which then gets into the accountability piece. You measure it, say you said that it's going to be agreed upon, and then the environment, how can we help you achieve this? So if you look at these rules of three, that the players first self correct, right? I love it when. They say, sort of team captain would say, hey, coach, can I talk to the team before we start? Because then that team captain may just set the tone, right? Hey, are we all ready to play? You now leave your worries at home, right? We, we ready to have fun here? All right, we're good, right? Okay, so if you can get that mindset, or if it isn't going well, then give a moment. You love those leaders. Say, coach, can I talk to the team a minute? Pull them in, and then you walk away and cool off a bit because you're upset the way they're playing, right? Or not performing, right? So then they take the ownership of it. So the players either, either self-correct or they help each other correct. And then the intervention piece is when we go in and we feel like we, we need to step in, right? Right? So I, I like this because you're sort of handing more control to the players but as coaches, sometimes we feel a little bit nervous about that, don't we? Right? Is the empowerment piece a little bit like, oh, maybe I'm not important? No, you're important, like, because when they play the game, we don't play the game. We're watching it, and we have no, really, not a lot of control. And Brett will tell you that with international sevens, right? How much control does a coach have? Yeah. So. But if you're going to empower players, you're going to have to back them. Because everybody makes mistakes. Coaches, we make mistakes. Players make mistakes, right? So we're going to have to encourage them and give them the courage to fail. Because how are they going to get better if they don't fail? 
How many times are you going to try to do something to really get good at it, right? It's okay to be failing, providing it's a learning process and you're working hard. Everybody loves effort in your players, don't you? I think you love effort, right? And particularly those that are less gifted, I love the effort because the effort means so much more because they don't have the tools. The worst thing is the talented players that don't have effort. Right? That would be the worst, right? So encourage failure because you could be really putting, there's pressure in the game, there's tension in the game. So if you don't encourage them to have a crack at something and to play a certain way, then try something, right? You know, as you as coaches, courage to fail. Maybe you played the game the same way for like your whole life. And there's different ways to play the game. Maybe you want to change the way you attack or change the way something in your game. But maybe you're not comfortable with it. Maybe the coaching staff aren't, aren't comfortable with it. But are you willing to have a crack at changing it? Give it a try, right? So that courage to fail. And if, if you really are courageous enough and maybe the, out of the failure, you're going to get success. And the fortitude to fix it, right? Just decide, okay, we're going to get after this and, and we're going to make it work, right? right? I'm going to be doing stuff on attack tomorrow and I think there's, I'm not saying it's the right way, but I'm just saying different ways. But if you're going to, if you're going to do it, then you've got to, you've got to try it. You've got to be creative and adventurous, both as players and coaches. Don't be worried about the failure. How do, how do you even measure failure or judge it, right? Yeah. If you're getting halfway to the target and you started at a quarter of the way to the target, it's success, right? So how are you going to measure it? Um, now we're going to get into this hot review process where um, is anybody standing right for the combine? Right, so we're gonna we're gonna play games with them, and there'll be three teams, and there'll be two teams playing. There'll be a team observing, getting the mental reps, and we're gonna ask them really two questions that they need to address. That's what are we doing well? Identify what we're doing well, and then what what do we need, or what could we do better? Right. So some questions always come up, right? So this hot review could be a minute, could be two minutes, team scores on you, you score, you're getting back to the halfway, hey, we need to keep that going. Well, what do you need to keep going? Or let's let's try and change it. So, a lot of that naturally should occur in good teams, but it, it does require a great deal of communication and buy-in. Right? So all, it means that all players have to be thinking. We want intelligent rugby players, right? Therefore, we have to go from knowledge, application, to get into analysis and synthesis. We need to get into higher thinking skills to fix stuff, right? And also identify what's working. So that process needs to happen pretty quick. If you've got like a halftime in a sevens game, how you how are you teaching the kids the process? Do you look at principles of the game? Do you look at possession? Do you look at go forward? Do you look at continuity, pressure, support? Are, are you making them think that way? Are you thinking that way? And then it's not for us to tell them necessarily, but to guide them through that process. And you have to teach the process, right? Because you say huddle up when you take when you start talking to each other about what just happened, right? Well, first of all, you'll probably get dumb looks from some of them lately. Right? And then you'll go from no talk to a lot of talk. And then they're going to have to triage it and say, OK, now, you, now you're talking. OK, so what's top of your list? Right? We're going to go back and play. What's the number one thing you want to do better in attack, for example? What's the number one thing you want to do better in defense? And let's say you're referee in the game. Right? You're on your own, that team and that team. Even better reason than part of them. Okay, let's work. Now, you get another stoppage, you get another review, and you say, okay, did you achieve that goal? Right? So, when I say rules one and two here apply 
we'd have to go back to self-correct, number one, and positive peer influence. Not somebody said, hey, you screwed up. It's all your fault. No, you don't want that. I mean, you want, hey, how can we, how can we do this better, right? But you need buy-in. There's going to be some players who are going to toggle, dominate the conversation, and there's going to be some players that don't say anything. How do you get that player bought in, right? Yeah. So it's it's. I think it's. You know, if they can self awareness and and how they're playing, some players are going to be overly critical of themselves, and some of them are just not going to see it at all, right? They're just maybe. They don't, they don't recognize it. But then the intervention from the coach. So let's say you think, oh my God, you know, like we, we, just, we just don't get this. Um, so if they're not, what could you do to sort of bring the topic up into the conversation? You might say, well, how do you think your passing is going? Uh, we're dropping the ball a lot. Okay, so we're dropping the ball. So what do we? Need? How can we make that better? Right. Uh, my club started their game, um, their, their season last week, and they they didn't tackle anybody and they didn't pat. They dropped every pass for probably the first fifteen minutes. <laughs> it's like I <laughs> played rugby like forever, right? and it was like it's pretty obvious. Um, what do you think's not working, or what do you think's working? There was nothing working for ten minutes. They ended up turning it around, but still. Um, you know, it's. I know we, and I've been there and done it. I want to step in and fix it, right? I want to fix the problem, but it's more powerful if they recognize it and they fix it, and we guide them in that direction for they realize it, right? So it needs to, it needs to, it's going to challenge you in your coaching style, or maybe maybe you are a really good facilitator. What are the kids used to in in, um, in other sports? What style of coaching? More direct? Tell them what to do? What's the danger for that for you as a coach? If you tell them what to do all the time, who do they rely on? You, right? So if the score of the game doesn't go well for them, who are they looking at? You. And then it's all on your shoulders. Like, hold on. We agreed we're going to play this way. Hey, this is, this is a shared responsibility here, right? You know, I'm not going home to cry in my pillow because you lost. Because you're not. It's a coach's fault. No, it's we we didn't get it right, right? What do we need to do better? So I think you know, it's up to you as coaches in your own journey as a coach as to how you think you want to do this and where you can get better. Um, I, um, you know, that's, you know, I'm working. I think I'm doing pretty good on time here. So, yeah, God, for me, normally I go way over. Um, I thought my wife called me from the back of the room, tell me to shut up. Put the phone out like that. But, yeah. So, what about some questions here? Um, anything, you know, the player empowerment piece, uh, the, the culture piece. Let's lay it open here. Come on, you got something you want to ask. Um, you had that one player in your team, the dominant one, the, the assertive one, and they start going down where it's detracting from the team. How do you how do you turn that around? Because I've had players that have come through that. You know, oh, well, you know, the Arnie man's killing him. You know, oh, he's gone real quick, but he gets caught at 10, you know, 10 yards out for the try line. What do you do then? Because no one's calling. But it's like, oh, he's gone, and you just see the whole team slow down. How do you change that, that type of mentality with with your players? And, and in particular, that one player, that one that is, he's going down, he's going to, you know, demands, but he's, almost the centerpiece of your team, too. You've got that much of an athlete there, especially when you talk high school, talk middle school. You usually get one, if you're lucky, two to three players that shine like that. Um, how do you steer that ship, so to speak? So he is a leader. Yes. And uh, he's 
he, he's not really leading in a positive way. Correct. All right? So, um, Brett, I'm going to bring, I'll put Brett in the slide here. So he went to BlackRock in Ireland, um, finished football at University of Arizona, said, I want to be a professional rugby player. I said, how the hell is that going to happen? With no MLR at the time. And then you started teaching at BlackRock prep. Remember you had that kid you talked to me about that you didn't know what to do with him? I know, because, <laughs> because he said to me that he's really good, and the, the little Irish guys run around, and they're really good at the game and skilled, you know? And, he, and, and BlackRock is like a factory for players. And I clearly said, what does he enjoy the most? Playing, right? And wh who controls whether he sits down and behaves himself or plays is you. So, now the other, to answer your question, the other players are going to, they know exactly what's going on, and they're going to wonder how you're going to deal with that player. Uh, so, uh, Tempe was playing Las Vegas, and it was a few years back, and our culture wasn't good. And we said to play, you have to show up at training. That would help, right? But they get, they get jobs, and you get all that stuff. And you got to, you know, and if everybody's showing up, then we'll pick the best players, right? The best players weren't showing up for various reasons, and they're all on the sideline. And they weren't even on the bench. And then the alumni said to me after the, we lost, well, how come your best players aren't playing? I said, well, they didn't show up to training, and, and therefore, how can we pick them? Right? And we went through some losses because you got, you're, going to be, you're going to be stuck in that situation where if that kid's not in the field, it may affect the outcome of the game in terms of you, you're losing maybe you're one of your star players. But there's your principles, right? What do you stand? What's important to you? In the long run, right? You know? And, and you, you're going to get struggles within that. So selection for this game against Red Mine, the big in-state rivalry, was, oh, wait, you know, let's pick this guy. Well, first of all, we're not even registered in the USA, right? For God's sake, so that's off the table. Well, let's pick that guy who just showed up on Tuesday night. No, because these other guys need to play. And what about the replacement scrum half who's really not very, not really good, but he needs to be good because that starter is going to get hurt or unavailable, and then we're going to need him, right? So you're juggling things with selections, aren't you? You're juggling what's for the betterment of the whole group rather than but the individuals are important, right? So if you were going to sit that kid, could you, could you see yourself having a conversation with him? And then what are, what are the rest of the team going to think when that kid doesn't start? Ooh, why is he not starting? Well, maybe then they'll quickly figure out something he did wasn't aligned to the team, right? So... Are you going to stand by your principles? Because it's okay saying all these culture things. Oh, man, we're going to be honest and, you know, we're, we're going to be a team. We're going to believe in teamwork. And then there isn't teamwork. And then what are you going to do? Right? It's all rosy when you're creating your values, but then what do they look like? And then how are you going to enforce them? And then who enforces that? When they're younger, you know, they're going to look to you for that direction, that leadership. You could say to the team, hey, well, wouldn't it help if you had a, a code of conduct? Do you have those? A living code of conduct, right? Right? Our youth team didn't have one at the start of the year, and then it all ran all over the place. And then they're, asked, they're trying to fix things when players don't know what the repercussions for that behavior is. Right, because they kept picking the stars that weren't showing up in training, because they're, you know, they're just doing their other thing. Right? How do you think that affects the team culture? You're training hard, and then so and so walks in and starts. He's never has been in training for two weeks. What message does that send? Right? You're picking the best. Yeah, we're gonna pick the best. So that kid that's trying really hard, where's that kid going? He's not coming back after a while, right? So, all right, questions. We've got a, five minutes here. Got more than one question. What about the empowerment stuff? 
Who's already bought into that? Who who practices that with their teams? You got it? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Has that just been your style all along, or did you yeah, move I, into that? It's been my style. I, I also coach high school football. Probably a unique situation. I coach football in the fall and rugby in the spring. Mm -hmm. It's always been my style, my style and work with those people. And when you find those individuals, and I've been coaching for 40 some years, when you find those individuals, and you get that one that's going to be the problematic one, you look for the second and third guy underneath them and you support them. They're also your allies. What's again, peer pressure is, is tremendous on those people. Um, you know, like I said, just like you said, that they let, them, let them work with it, work with it. And I've had meetings and all of a sudden says, all right, GD, you're going to get this fixed. You've got one week. Well, I'm going to come in and write the ship. And you guys give them your act together. So you put on the players. Uh, put the players on, and, and it's amazing how we will be going to see that in response from parents also. Well, I was, gonna, I was just going to ask a question about parents. To get the parents on board with the culture also. Yep. Do we need to, you know, inform the parents this is the culture, right? That, the, that you're going to go with, right? Because yep. otherwise, that could go down a rocky road. Exactly. Also, yeah. if, right? if you don't, and we had this situation three years ago, wasn't in rugby, was in football, and all of a sudden we had a very good team, and guys quit showing up, bench them, mother was a lot of other pressure, came on, somebody quit, everything went right down the tubes. Two years later, this year, we were in the quarterfinals of the state playoffs. So stick to your values and hold those values and hold them accountable. Young people need to be held accountable for what they're doing and to, to become better. And sometimes it's real easy for us people to, to slide down that deep slope to find your quickest fund so we look at winning. But once again, if you're in this coaching and you've been here a long time, it's not the W's and the L's. It's how you develop them to be better people in your, in your society. Oh, well said. Yeah, that's tremendous. Um, when kids come to winter camp for me, I ask for two teacher references. I don't. I don't want coaches. Coaches enable. We enable stuff. We we enable. We we gloss over the problem child because oh, we want the kid to get the opportunity, right? And um, I should have known I had one kid this year, he didn't get any teachers to give him a reference. Red flag. Because he was a disaster at school, right? Now we, we're giving him the opportunity to grow because you never want to shut the door on kids. But at the same time, if you can't find two teachers that like it to write a reference, it says, are you honest, responsible, reliable, dependable? Do you help others in class? Right? Check, 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 always, sometimes, boom. I get occasionally, and then I'll write to the teachers, right? You know, and then I'll let the parents know. And so, you know, are you asking about kids in school? Because, they're the, they, you know, if you got, like, hell on wheels on your rugby team, they're probably going to be bad wherever they are, right? Uh, does it keep the kid from going down the wrong road? I'm not saying everybody has to be a you know, in the choir, right? We're going to get at risk kids that are going to make mistakes, and we probably have a major influence on them. So I'm not saying that it just all has to be perfect, plain sailing. But then again, there has to be accountability, right? And if it's incremental improvements, like a kid said to me, I've got a problem with, with I'm dishonest. Well, the fact that he acknowledged that problem Maybe it's going to help because then he's maybe going to start and be more honest, right? So I think it's all individuals because we we, we do want to help you know young people grow and not everybody's going to come out you know the way we want it, right? Okay, um, we're on time. We're going to finish. Um, thank you, and uh, hopefully I'll see you. Um, you know, I'll see you over the course of this conference. And thank you, Brett. All right? Thanks, guys.